Yeah, thank you all for coming. I can't believe you guys are crazy to come out this early. I guess it's the donuts. It's all, it's all the donuts. But thank, thanks for coming. It's fun to be here in this amazing space. I, this, I already knew that I was in the wrong profession. Now I know for sure. <laughs> I mean, this is an incredible thing that they have here. I really had no, no idea. So um, a short talk. If I learn how to work the clickers, great. So um, I'll just talk this morning since it is a pretty short talk, about uh, four different investigations, four different ways of pursuing, uh, for us, I guess, a way of talking about it is pursuing what architecture can reveal. I like this term, amplifiers. I use it in some of the writing. Um, the notion that certain aspects of architecture can, can elevate and exaggerate and ideally reveal some form of insight about either a landscape or an activity, a context, uh, any, any, any sort of physical or experiential property um, that I think is important and or can be elevated and isolated. And it's an interesting, for us, it's, a, it's, a, it's always an investigation. It's always new. It's a way of, I mean, it's really for us, when, you, when we start a project, we use these four different amplifiers and they're really kind of artificially distinguished in some ways here for the purposes of conversation. But we use these methods and means of looking and making and inquiring to discover what's possible, to really attempt to find what the architecture can address, what it can amplify and elevate. Um, so whether it's structure or materiality or natural light or, or any of the various means of looking, we use a lot of the tools that I'll show today and share the various projects um, to try to find those things. So it's kind of a search. I guess this talk in, in, in spirit is, is a search through, through different, means of, different means of making. Um, the physical, I suppose, I'm isolating that in just a conversation about form. <clears throat> how one finds form and how one pursues form. And, and I think for the architects in the crown, you know that we use structure as a primary means of investigation. But it's, but it's looking for a quality that isolates an experience, I think. The Mary Hill piece, which most folks have seen, was really about how one builds and locates, and um, I, think, I think locate is a key word, how one makes a space be a reference for a particular landscape, and that powerful, powerful landscape, and that very small gesture of the 100-foot long piece of concrete, where there is an act of measurement and an act, and an act of orientation in that incredibly immense landscape. This is a sketch for a guest house that we did in upstate, uh, upstate New York and Dutchess County. And again, it's interesting, all of these, all of these things I'm about to show in this category have some, some means of bridging, I think, some means of extension. And this, this little guest house, the first sketch that I did and the subsequent concept models were a way of trying to literally weave this house into its site. And it, and it was a bridge in some ways. That structure, that, that eight inch piece of steel that you see in the diagrams there, is a bridge between the infinite of the forest and the intimacy of residential occupation. And, and we, that's, that's something that's come up that we've discovered recently that's, that's really interesting in, in, a, in a residential context. Well, every, every, every activity has its scale and to, and to and to work the structure to, to bridge that scale of whether it's the urban or the rural or whatever the context may be, to bridge that sense of the immensity of, of, of context and, and of condition to the specificity of an act or the specificity of an activity, whether it's a dwelling or an art museum. Um, these are sketches that began the project for a, a, a regional museum in Quebec City. It was a competition that we did a few years ago. And I show these just as the evolution of the conversation and the different media that we use. I mean, we use charcoal, we use digital representation, we use animation, and we use physical making. And we, and we use it at various, uh, various points in the process. Um, you know, there, there's a lineal progression to this making of architecture. It was interesting when we did the Pixar animation studio a, a couple years ago. We did some sort of programming analysis for them to sort of reveal to them what they did and how they did it, you know, because they were just busy making wildly successful films. 
And, but their activity took about four years to make. A, a movie took about four years to make and about 250 people at, it, at its peak. And architecture is about the same, interestingly enough. I mean, most of our projects that aren't houses, although some of the houses have taken that long, are about four to six years. And they ramp up and down. And so our media sort of follows that. And sometimes we double back in the media. We can be well into working drawings. And we double back to some of these concept models just to sort of question and to, well, question and hopefully affirm some of our assumptions. And that's the final image of that Quebec Museum. So, so these formal investigations begin with various, various means, various media, and also find their inspiration in various, in various ways. The, the National Music Center of Canada is a project that's under construction right now, and it really began with that, well, I guess it began with two things. It began with that landscape, this enormous, enormous, powerful landscape that is, that is Alberta. And then also, it began with thinking about the kind of intimate acts of making of musical instruments and the kind of craft in musical instruments. And so from those two scales, you know, enormously distinct and diverse scales, we, we started the investigation and we used the concept model. This is the concept model that we took actually to the interview. Like, you know, can you imagine, what the hell is that, <laughs> right? Because it's not, it's not it, it, you have to do some fast talking. It's not representation, you know, this is not your building. It's really a bunch of cut up pieces of instruments cast into plaster and then ground, and yeah, you, know, you lose them pretty quick. But <laughs> yeah, they just nod and they hope that you'll make a building for them. <laughs> so, um, but we were just trying to capture the spirit of the monumentality of, that we hoped the building would have, the distinction between inside and out, the kind of activities and instruments of the building. And then after we won the competition and began pursuing the architecture, we, we went through a process of taking those distinct five-story pieces and join, joining them together into one experience. So five different, or I think it was nine different pieces, five stories high, and how to make it one building and one thing and, and one experience. So again, media shifts. You know, we did a tremendous amount in our doing. Kyle Caldwell, a shout out. It's all his fault, actually, to tell you the truth. Um, because, yeah, it's, it's sort of one of those questions, just because you can do it, should you? <laughs> and, I, and I think as we're in working drawings on this crazy thing, we, we revisit that question again and again. So, the evolution of that forum that began really with that understanding of the monumentality of the landscape, the power that the building needed to stand there, the power that the building needed to represent the, the, the interests of a country and the aspirations of a nation, and then bringing that together into the form of the architecture that, that hopefully achieves, achieves all of those things. And then becomes an icon in the city something that stands. I mean, that you, you move from the intimacy of the Dutchess County House that really uh, creates and joins and binds you to a landscape to dwell in a domestic way to the activities of a larger landscape in an urban context that really becomes something that you hope binds a nation together in an understanding of a kind of history of an activity, a cultural activity of making, making music. The visceral is something we talk about a lot at Allied Works, um, and God knows what that means. Um, I think that's why we use it. There's so many ways to think about the visceral as a kind of immediate and tangible and physical and, and, uh, and some, sometimes spiritual sense of perception. Um, and the more I, more I investigate this world of architecture, I think the more I'm interested in the realm of exploration of what that can be. This is a project that we did, a proposal that we did for the Portland Art Museum to do an installation back when Terry Tottemeyer had his show on the Columbia River, the photographs of the Columbia River. And we were going to install this in the atrium. And it was an idea of above and below. We took that two-story space. It was a vague reference to the Columbia Gorge and the Columbia River. Uh, we took that two-story space, divided it where above the railing it was hung with cables and wires and about 10,000 watts of light to kind of almost create a white light environment. And below, it was a somewhat subterranean, submerged environment of that light uh, moving through perforated, a perforated veil and a series of fans that would create a flickering sense of being under, basically under the light, not necessarily under 
anything else. And just trying to evoke that above and below, the light quality of the Columbia Gorge, the in and the out. Um, this is a project that we just finished. Some of you were at the opening, I think, last weekend. This, this is the, the Sokoblosser Winery Tasting Room. And this, again, just shows an investigation towards the physical. And it's, it's funny, a lot, a lot of our projects have a very elemental initial pursuit of a here and a there, an in and an out, above and below. You know, just beginning with a really basic sense of perception and how one might, how one might investigate that. This building, we, we, we wanted it to be, have the sense of being carved out of the earth of the Dundee Hills. The exterior, we wanted it to be rough, and the interior, we wanted it to be much more refined. So the concept model and the early computer renderings, searching for those qualities that kind of carved and dark and held and enclosed, really, really protected in some ways. So you're in that beautiful landscape, extending out over the Willamette Valley and up into the Dundee Hills, but yet held in a, in, a, in a kind of compressed, a sort of sense of tension between being held and safe and intimate against all of the weather of, of, of the Pacific Northwest, but connected to that beautiful landscape. This is a competition that we did for a museum in Lausanne a couple of years ago. Again, I show this just because I, uh, the, the relationship between that sketch and the model we really wanted the building, the building was along a railroad track, it had to be kind of stout and protect itself from lots and lots and lots of train activity, but yet open out to this spectacular views of Lake Geneva and the Alps. So we, we, we created, created a very singular bound element and then literally split it open. And so the concept model below of the piece of wood, oh, below, it's below there, but now, there. This was the concept model for, for the museum itself this idea that it was a solid that was split open by the light and by the natural views and the power sense of the landscape, which then evolved into a structural investigation of these rotating and pivoting walls um, that resulted then in the subsequent building that had that particular quality. Uh, the Clifford Still Museum, project that was just finished about a year and a half ago. Um, I went and visited the site uh, early on. We hired the photographer, Vicky Sambonaris, to take photographs of the landscape around there, out in the prairie and the plains. You know, Denver is a prairie city. It's not a mountain city. It's a long ways from the mountains, actually, contrary to its branding and marketing campaigns. Um, <laughs> and con uh, contrary to that museum next to us that has a rather external reference to the mountain range. Um, this building wanted to really be about the surface of the prairie, to really bring the light down to that surface. This was a concept model that we also took to an interview that was really about the mass of the earth. There's a sort of foreground in front of the building that's the low piece. Mass of the building, that the building really is of the earth and of the prairie, and that the light is brought down into the earth and into the building. So this whole thing of pulling pulling things down, pulling light down, pressing you and holding you against the immensity of the, of the prairie. And then the building being embedded in a landscape so that the mass of the building extends out to a mass of trees. Um, and the concept model that we did, this is a sort of mid-stage concept model. The concept model that we did for that really, really uh, exaggerated those things. I th this, this idea that these the concept models, I think, are really, really important for us because what they're trying to do is identify a quality, and I think that's why a lot of them show up in, the, in this visceral category. They're trying to uh, identify a quality that we're pursuing, and that, and that quality is not, we don't know yet, I mean, the quality will permeate all aspects of the building, but you don't know if it's primarily that quality is in the structure or if that quality is primarily in the landscape. It gets back to that question of scale again. It depends on the building, it depends on the activity in the building itself and where it is, you know, whether it's structure that holds that basic concept, whether it is landscape, whether it's detailing and how things come together and the more intimate scaling of a piece of architecture. But, the, but these concept models themselves are really trying to define that primary sense. And so from, from the first compressed charcoal model to the routed out block of wood to then about 150 different structural studies um, just looking with museum board, um, those models are about this big, of how the walls make rooms and how those rooms intersect in section and in space. Um, 
And then into the material quality itself. So we've sort of jumped from the very beginning concept then to the very, very physical of wanting that building to be of the earth. We even, we, we wish the building could be made out of, 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 of obsidian. That was one of my fantasies. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that one didn't last very long. <laughs> we actually tried to put obsidian in the concrete, only to find that the glass doesn't bind, and it has, it has all kinds of trouble. But we, had, we found a source. You know, we thought we were just going to take a truck out to Eastern Oregon and get some, get some obsidian, but <laughs> there's some place in Brazil where you can actually, they mine obsidian, just in case you want to <laughs> try to go there. I'll be jealous if you can figure it out. So, you know, all the way through then the materiality, you know, it, this slide shows the compression of that building, this lobby that's 150 feet long, cantilever of concrete, 10 feet high, that holds you down with light coming from the side, and then the light coming from above through those beautiful gallery spaces. Um, the luminous. So light is a tremendous generator of the work, um, whether it's the material quality of the facade in Clifford Still, that engages the light, whether it's filling rooms with light for art, um, just how we, how we grow to understand the available light in a place, how we think about the building might address that light in various ways, from the material to the spatial. But it's always an investigation, always a question for us, and, and always the, the sort of ideal pursuit, I think, in all aspects of the architecture. And it must come from growing up in the Pacific Northwest you know, where there's an absence of light for about six months out of the year. So that, you, know, you, you grow to cherish what little light we have and, and, and try to take it and amplify it and elevate it as much as, much as possible. So the, the Museum of Arts and Design on Columbus Circle, that building is completely, every act of architecture we did in that building is about light. We cut it open to bring light in and then we reclad it to engage the light and give the light back to the city. It's, it's a building that has uh, facades on all four sides that receive light. It's very uncommon for New York. Um, so one of the things that we wanted to do from the very beginning was, was to develop a material system for the exterior that would take that light and, and bring life to that light. So this idea of, of, of a nacreous finish, I learned that word, by the way. <laughs> That's what, in the, in the kind of pearls and muscles and all those things, um, that iridescence um, is a nacreous iridescence, I guess. I'm probably still not using it right, actually, after all these years. So we spent about two years working with a Dutch ceramic company, Royal Tischelar, uh, to develop an architectural glaze that was iridescent um, and clad the building in that, you know, looking, again, a, a direct response to site, um, looking for ways for that building to subtly change and shift. And your point of view changes, that it's approached from so many different ways, up 8th Avenue and 59th Street and, and Central Park West and Broadway, and there's so many ways of engaging that building. And at different times of day, at different times of the year, it takes on a distinct light and quality and character. So with Clifford Still Museum, there was the light on the exterior, the light filtering down through that canopy of trees, the light uh, as the shadow pattern on the facade of that broken concrete. And then there was the light that we wanted to create and give to the paintings of Clifford Still. So we wanted the building to have that mass and that unity, so the entire building is side cast concrete. So how do you bring, excuse me, those donuts. Um, how, how do you bring, yeah, that's a, I should have the donut after. Uh, how do you bring that light through the body of the building that's also something about the Clifford Still Museum that we talked about from the very beginning, that that, that body of that building be the giver of light. So it, it, through the shadow patterns and the way the concrete was made, it would, uh, it would exaggerate the qualities of sun and the angles of sun different times of year on the facade. And then inside, you'd have the body of the building give the light back to the paintings. So the light passes through this slab. We did, you know, we like to study things as many times as humanly possible. Um, as far as I can tell, but we, we, I mean, it's really extraordinary too because what we could do with the digital tools we have in the daylighting programs, uh, we were, and then working with Arab engineers in New York, the daylighting engineers, we could really come very close to understanding the quality of the light using, using the digital tools that we had, but 
how one perforates that ceiling. The ceiling is a side cast ceiling. It's actually a structural ceiling, structural slab. And that's a sort of series of, and cycle of part of the investigations we did, sort of arriving in the lower right image, and then a gallery like, like that. And, and I couldn't be more thrilled. I mean, these paintings are so extraordinary. They'd never been seen in natural light before this building was, was, was made. Um, and that was one of the motivations for me from the very start was to have the opportunity. I mean, I wanted the opportunity for myself even just to see those paintings in natural light. And the, and the light is, is really extraordinary. It's almost a liquid light. It has a quality, you know, if, you, if you've been to the um, Sai Tuomli Museum um, or the Rothko Chapel or, or even, the, even the Kimball. I mean, all of those buildings, such extraordinary pieces of architecture with amazing light. This light is different. It's a really, really strong light, but it is entirely different. It is fascinating to me that, that light can have that kind of visceral, visceral difference. We're working on a project right now uh, in Charleston, South Carolina, and kind of advancing the conversation of light that we started in Clifford Still with the building being, being the, the translator and the, and the, and the and the, tr and the giver of light. Um, in Charleston, South Carolina, we're bringing, li we're bringing daylighting then through big cantilevered structural walls that become also sunscreened, but they diffuse and elevate the light too. Um, so we're working with Arup again and KPF engineers, KPFF engineers in Portland um, to work on those structural wall, model those structural walls so they're models of structure and they're models of daylighting. Um, it's really, an amazing, amazing investigation because it's so interesting now for those of you who care about such things, we sure do. They can plot the sky domes in any city in the world at any time of the year now. They have the data. They have this enormous data on light um, and it all gets averaged out, of course. But they can tell you, we can point, you know, we can build a digital model and point to a place on the wall and ask how many foot candles are, all, are there on November 27th and they can tell you and how it comes through the ceiling and gets to that wall. It's an extraordinary thing. And again, that's the science of it. The perception of it is an entirely different animal. But it's an incredible conversation, one that we're really excited about having. But so how the light comes through that wall, how it affects the nature of the structure, and then how it affects the quality of the space inside. We're, we're right in the middle of this. We're just starting working drawings here in the near future. But it's an incredible, it's a really wonderful investigation. And Charleston, South Carolina has this kind of milky, you know, southern low country light. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a new investigation. That's what's so fun too when you get to, you know, in a different city, in a different context with each individual building, what, we're, what inspires the investigation for us are the specificities of those things. I mean, I think I want to mention that too. Part of what we try to do at Allied Works and it gets, it's more and more important to me the longer I'm in this conversation of architecture. What we try to do is render the buildings as absolutely as explicit and particular and even exclusive to that place as possible. And that place means the physical context, the cultural context, the kind of activity. We, we strive to make uh, an experience in a building that can only exist, you know, at that, in that place, in that city, in this time for that purpose. And I think the things that are as specific and even exclusive, as exclusive as that, are the things that last. You know, it, it's sort of the opposite of popular mythology of flexibility and neutrality. It's the things that are really of a particular value are the things that resonate with us, I think. So certainly a pursuit that we're interested in. This, this distinction of the perceptual really has to, do with visual qualities, and, and it's kind of a new, it's, it's a new investigation for us. It relates to some of the ambiguity of the space that we've been creating, I think, some of the larger spatial ambiguities, the sort of tension between in and out and here and there, and so now it's becoming visual in addition to all of those other things. This is a house that we did in Dutchess County. This is the main house. It's a glass house. I'll go back. Oops. You know, it's, it's a glass house. That's the concept model. It's a, it has translucent glass, opaque glass, and clear glass. And the, the form itself as this orthogonal helix was intended to do exactly what I said. It was sort of blur, hold, hold that landscape at the same time as letting the landscape permeate it and loop through it. And the materiality was intended to both reflect 
and, and not reflect and become the sort of veil in, in, the, in the landscape itself. Incredible, incredible sight. Um, and it changes again with the light and the time of day. Obviously when the, when the interior lights aren't on, it's a, it's a very opaque building because of the glass. And in the, in the course of designing the building, we entered into a conversation with the artist Doug Aiken and talked about the quality of the architecture and what it was attempting to reveal about that landscape, what it was trying to connect to and, and elevate. And he came back with a proposal then to film the site and project the site back on the building. So very much what the building was trying to do in some ways, but then elevated and amplified by his particular means of exploration. This is an actual photo of the house at night. Um, so, so that the house becomes this other mechanism for representing ideas about sight, ideas about proximity, about nearness and farness, time of day, time of year, all of that, all of those things. And it's an incredible, incredible, how people go to bed at night is an interesting <laughs> question, but live for art. Live, 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 live for art. They're, they're amazing art collectors, very serious art collectors. One can probably guess from that. Um, so this is then the, the, some of the interior investigations of the, Clifford, uh, of the Sokoblasser Winery, where you know, that exterior concept model and the distinction between inside and outside and the kind of compression of those layers and the idea of it being solid and carved and broken back open, all of those sort of more abstract pursuits and then beginning the digital modeling of just looking at that space and being, once you're inside that simple bar of, of architecture, once you're inside, having the inside have that sense of the infinite and the labyrinth and, and all of the different kinds of spaces and the way the light acts. And then using the wood itself then to, to begin to contradict some of those spatial relationships. You know, whether, whether it's a flat roof, whether the roof is, has form and is holding you, it, be, it, it brings surfaces forward and takes surfaces back. It begins to make subtle shifts in light and materiality. So you're in this very simple, simple physical place with, with a myriad of perceptions and experiences depending on, again, the time of day and the quality of light um, that, that it's in. So you should go. <laughs> It's a, it's a, well, I mean, anything to be in that landscape, basically. Anything to be out in that incredible landscape is worth doing. I think this is the last thing. So, this is, the last thing was actually kind of the first thing. I guess I was sleepy last night when I was doing this. But we did a project in the Ace Hotel, interestingly enough, which allowed us to literally pursue some of these ideas. Many of you may know this, this program. I don't know if it was World War II or earlier. One, was it one? Where they hired the artists? to come up with a new concept of camouflage, and they call it, which is, I mean, of course you do that. I mean, I don't know what happened to that thinking. It's, it seems to be gone from our culture, but, but the idea that the artist could come up with visual camouflage, so it's called the dazzle pattern. And I, I, the first time I saw these pictures about five or six years ago, I just couldn't believe it. I just thought it was absolutely brilliant. So we were given this little room in the Ace Hotel to just do a little art piece, I guess, it was in, in conjunction with a talk I was giving there, and then we had a book party. Uh, anyway, so it, it was a lot of fun. So we, we tried to create a sense of the infinite in this little room. Um, and then we thought, well, we're from the Pacific Northwest, so we made this piece called The Forest from the Trees. Um, and this is the actual space. You know, with the, we, we mapped some photographs onto the space um, to see if we could achieve some of these qualities of ambiguity of the, of the here and the air. And I, I would imagine after drinking all night at the Ace, it must have been <laughs> an interesting, we made a, a hosable floor. Um, <laughs> well, we hope the winery doesn't have that problem. Um, anyway, so, so those, those are some of the things that we're interested in, I think, again, sort of distinguished by category just for the sake of conversation. But all of them, and it's, it just becomes so fascinating to me to find, you know, understanding the body of this potential conversation and this investigation of the possibilities of architecture. And I, I guess that's what's interesting to me, to me too, is, is entering into a problem, into a project and a site and a city, 
um, entering into that with the question of what can architecture do? What, you know, what, what can architecture address in this problem that only architecture can address? And then within that question, what can structure address that materiality can't, right? Or what can each individual act of architecture from the enormity of structure down through the, the, the detailing of a doorknob you know, where do those things resonate and where do those things find their home in this conversation of perception and experience? And then what can each of those acts of making offer to your understanding of that place and that, and that activity? And so the range has grown in Allied Works. It's interesting, it's, it's grown and it's grown in, in some simple ways in splitting and gilding wood and it's grown in ways of digital, the digital tools we use. Uh, and, and so it's just been a fascinating uh, evolution, and it's a treat to be able to share it with you this morning. So thanks. Thanks for coming.